Hey, hello everyone. This is Peter Zemsky, Deputy Dean and Strategy Professor here at INSEAD, coming to you live from our Fontainebleau campus. And um, we've got a really lovely webinar in store for you. This is part of our Tech Talk series, where we're really trying to look at the expanding technology possibilities that are coming at us, how you drive effective applications that create real business value, and looking at the broader impacts on management, business, and society. Um, if you've got ideas for different topics, for speakers we might have, go to Digital at INSEAD and get in touch with us and, and suggest these ideas. We do this for you. Um, so this webinar with, with David Northacker is especially um, poignant for me. Before he was a leading European founder scaling up an exciting business, I first met David back as an MBA student in 2014. Um, next slide, please. So at, at that time, ironically, I recently reconnected with Fred Mozilla, who just raised his first 100 million round for Blah Blah Car. And in core strategy, we brought Fred in, we did a case, a brand new case on Blah Blah Car. What should they do with that 100 million? And we had students, all the students at INSEAD, working on advice for Fred. The group that probably got the most excited, the most pumped up about these possibilities was David's group. And although the, the assignment had been, where should Blah Blah Car grow geographically, David and his group were, were really obsessed with this idea of diversification into the parcel business. And when they realized that Blah Blah Car um, wasn't really going to be a fit with delivering parcels, they pivoted, started looking at how to drive parcel deliveries across bus networks. Um, and that's when David went off to pursue his idea. Next slide, please. Um, we're gonna hear from, from David about how he ended up having to pivot that business. The, the sharing economy approach to um, parcel delivery didn't work out, but he ended up um, very successful idea, again, with a B2B platform connecting small mom and pop truck businesses, 50 to five to 50 trucks with big shippers across Europe. And has really, if you look at the next slide here, um, you can see he sort of hits on this. He himself, ironically, has now raised 100 million um, and is working through what to do with that investment. You can see really getting traction here, 18, 19, but fundamentally taking off in 2020. So while many of us have been suffering or struggling, David and Sender are one of those businesses that seem to have been at the right place at the right time. Let's hear more from the founder, David Newthacker. Come on in, turn on your camera, David. Good to have you with us. Where are Hello, you today? Peter. I'm great. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. All right, so, so tell us, so you, 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 you get all excited in INSEAD, you're in the venture competition, pursuing your dream. How's that work out after INSEAD? Well, after graduating, I thought I figured out everything and I just had to implement the idea that I developed throughout the entire MBA that I pitched at the venture competition. Uh, I moved to Berlin with the MBA co-founder, Nicholas Stefan, and it took us just over a year to realize that our first idea um, uh, was not really working. Um, why we didn't have a single customer that signed up. Uh, we were offering same-day parcel delivery, as you mentioned, using buses for the cross-regional piece and uh, last-mile delivery companies for, uh, for the, the city delivery. It was a crazy idea now that I think about it. Uh, a lot of people told me that it would be very complex and very difficult. Of course, I ignored uh, everyone and, and had to learn the hard way. And then, uh, yeah, when we almost were running out of money, we raised a lot of money from well, back then for me, it was a lot of money from inter professors and, uh, and classmates. Um, uh, we were yeah, at the end of, of the funding uh, that we had, and we almost uh, ended up uh, filing for bankruptcy. But then an angel investor knocked on our door. Uh, he signed a term sheet with us. And a couple of minutes after we signed the term sheet, my back then co-founder, Nicholas, told me that he wanted to go back to consulting. Um, and this was a bit of a tricky moment for me as uh, I knew that we had to reinvent our business model, uh, even though with the money that could have been possible, but we had to pivot again because the same day pass the delivery business did not work. Um, and I knew that without Nicholas, I didn't want to 
want to do this. Um, so then I called my dad, told him what the situation was like, that we probably would lose the investor and therefore um, had to have to, uh, to file for bankruptcy. And my dad told me to try one last thing before giving up, which was just call the investor, explain him the situation, tell him that he, want, he has to invest only into you. And this is then what I did. It took me some time, but eventually the agent investor was convinced. He, re he renegotiated the, the terms of the deal. That was good for him. And then I restarted. And I restarted with uh, today's business model with two new co-founders, uh, Julius and Nico. Um, today we are digital freight forwarder with a focus on road freight. In the US, you would call us a broker. Our business model is uh, comparable to that of Uber Freight. And uh, now we're 700 people across seven offices in Europe. Can you tell us a little, how did you find that product market fit? Was it just next door? How, how, how did you, you know, where did, the, where did the light bulb go off, the right light bulb? Well, remember we were trying to sell cross-regional same-day parcel delivery. And our thought was everyone that was not called Amazon and Zalando needed a competing offering so that they could also be fast in deliveries. So we approached 90 something e-commerce. They all said interesting, but we're not willing to pay the extra premium. And at the end, we went back to Amazon and told them, listen, maybe we can serve same day delivery to smaller cities. We know you're doing it yourself by combining line halls and last mile, uh, but maybe in smaller cities, we can do it with buses and the last mile that we provide and told us, David, it's not gonna work. But in our presentation, they saw that next to the buses, the Flix buses, we had small vans and small trucks. And they told us, can you offer us these small vans and trucks for this cross regional part because all our big freight brokers and forwarders we work with only have this big 40 ton trucks that you typically see in the highway. We had nothing to lose, but had no clue. No, of, no of small trucks. <laughs> no small trucks. Uh, but we said, yes. And, and this is how we started. For the first year, we only did the smaller trucks for Amazon, Zalando, Notebooks, Billiga, getting up to 100% of the same day lanes, connecting the warehouses with the city the same day to allow parcels to be delivered in the afternoons if someone ordered before lunchtime. And only then we actually understood that the opportunity was much bigger. And only one year after pivoting and getting into this brokerage business, we realized that um, actually vans and small trucks was just a starting point. And then we pivoted. Today, 95% of our business is with the big trucks, which is also the big market. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, when, when we then pivoted, it was 100% with small trucks. So it was also a very interesting learning. What, what's the value added of your platform, right? So I guess on the one side, you've now got these smaller operators running these trucks. The other side, you got people with goods to move. What, what are you doing? Why, why, why do you have value? And, and why are you starting to be able to consolidate the market on that? Absolutely. Um, it's important to understand how inefficient and fragmented this market is in the first place. So 70% of all trucks in Europe are owned by companies that have fewer than 10 trucks. This means that there's a lot of subcontracting. If Coca-Cola needs a truck in Italy, they might call a forwarder or broker in Germany that calls their partner for Italy that sits in Milan that calls someone in the south of Italy that calls his neighbor that has a driver. And, um, and why is this the case? Because without technology today, um, you have 30 numbers or email addresses that you can reach out to and everyone has 30 and 30. So this is how you connect and that's why they're subcontracting. And for the first time with our technology, we're able to directly connect with the neighbor in the example I just gave in the south of Italy, meaning that we take out uh, middlemen uh, and therefore able to offer better prices, but at the same time, more visibility and more capacity. So the topic of having trucks available in a flexible way at a competitive um, um, prices is what allowed us allows us today to get in and start working with big uh, uh, big shippers. And this is the starting point. We first provide a commodity again, which is more flexible and better priced. And now, then, in the second step, evolving into becoming a value add partner for ABM Bev. They just announced today a big partnership uh, 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 with uh, carbon neutral um, transport or transport with reduce CO2, with a reduced CO2 footprint. We help them through integration with the systems, optimize the time slot and the operation management and, and a few other things that, uh, that uh, we then do in the second step. So let's, let's come back maybe to some of the carbon neutral stuff. That, that could be a really interesting topic to delve into, but to get the story out, so you get product market fit, 
you you stumble on it, you get you finally get the big trucks. Talk about how how did you how have you approached growth, and also the geographic spread. Um, you're 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 basically looking pan European in the end. Um, yeah, our hypothesis is that when it comes to road freight, we're going to see continental champions. We look at sea and air freight and logistics, we're going to see global champions. Flexport is, for example, one example, bringing a container from China to Europe or to the US is more or less the same level of complexity. When it comes to road freight, it's different, even though it sounds counterintuitive, because in each continent, we try to bring together demand and supply. But the geographic differences is, um, make uh, require different technology and different approaches to, to be developed. And this is why also Uber Freight, when they came to Europe, struggled a lot because they tried to use the US platform with an app, a lot of drive uh, owner operators that uh, they were serving the US were not present here in, in, in Europe. So let's say this is let's say, um, uh, why we decided to only focus on Europe and also decide to expand geographically because at the end of the day, logistics starts with a personal relationship both on the shipper side and the carrier side. And this is why we decided to open seven offices all over the past uh, 14 months, uh, because we realized that the local presence is extremely important. A French shipper, it might be a supermarket change to casino, needs to have a contact point in France, the same for small trucking companies that have up to 50 trucks. And this is why we decided to decentralize. And the past year was pretty crazy. We grew from 200 people just a year ago to 700, um, but now have this local presence and are able to better source capacity and better connect and serve with our, our shippers, our customers. Is, is the pandemic playing into this rapid growth over the last year, or was it more you were just ready to take off at this point? Well, we planned a year ago when we prepared the budget for 2020 with our board to expand uh, geographically, but it turned out to be different than we planned. We did two major acquisitions this year. One was the French company Everroad, and we planned to expand into France, uh, but with an organic approach rather than acquiring company. The same with Uber Freight in Amsterdam. So um, COVID uh, allowed us to unlock these opportunities that probably um, would have not been possible on one side. I've wrote as they were fundraising, realized it probably would be better to team up with us and with Uber Freight, um, uh, the, the US management realizing that they would have to invest significant resources in developing the European market and therefore also decided uh, to join forces with us. And then probably this would have not been possible uh, with, uh, without Corona. Um, and this is why we definitely planned an expansion, but did not plan to grow this quickly. Make it also implicitly in what you're saying, this is a bit of a winner take all market. There's gonna be a, a main European platform. That was your hypothesis going in? Absolutely. I don't know if I would call it a winner takes it all simply because the market is very fragmented. The top five forwarders in Europe have a combined market share of 6%. But when it comes to, uh, to digital players, then absolutely yes. Especially um, as we compete for fundraising and this is what investors love is to, to invest into the number one. And this is also what makes us in Europe very unique uh, because we're significantly bigger now than the number two, number three by factor five, six or seven. While in the US, if you look at Uber Freight, you have five other players that called Convoy, Transfix and so on, all playing in, let's say, in the same league and, and, and trying to, to, to become or claim uh, leadership while in Europe that's, uh, that's different. And it was a nice product, byproduct, I, hope, I almost would say, uh, of these acquisitions that we made this year. Interesting. Uh, there's a bit of a link in my mind to, to Blah Blah Car, which at the time we studied them had just done this mega hundred million round, which basically law knocked the German player carpool.com out because they couldn't, couldn't match that. To put you on the spot, might, might we see uh, more fundraising coming in, 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 in the year ahead? Well, now that we consolidated the market, there's a lot of inbound interest. We still have um, a majority of the 100 or just over 100 billion that uh, we uh, raised. So we're looking whether we find the right partner, but there's definitely right now a lot of interest. And we see markets at the moment are extremely hot. There's so many VCs and investors that want to deploy uh, money. So we're trying to see whether this uh, is an opportunity that uh, we want to want to do. It was an exciting year so far. So let's see whether we have more news uh, by the end of uh, of of, uh, of January, uh, December. Do you sometimes pinch yourself? I mean, the things seem to like have really fallen in place so well. 
relative to where you were when you called your dad? Um, is it has the reality fully sunk in? Not yet, I think. I think you have to ask me in two or three years' time. I'm just in the middle of this. It's I, I probably don't really understand what has been going on and also what the negative implications are. Growing an organization this quickly, adding so much, has uh, uh, means addressing a lot of challenges and probably we're mm. going to have to do that next year. Um, so right now, there's still a lot of excitement also because with the Uber freight acquisition, we placed ourselves really ahead of, of competition and we were able to acquire what we always saw as a role model. We always looked at the Uber Fred and this gave the entire organization a lot of energy, but probably next year when we come back from the, the Christmas holiday, we probably have to start cleaning up and upgrading a lot of aspects, processes in the organization to, to match the size that we today have. How many? Thanks for sharing that. That's, that's very, very transparent. Um, how many? Um, how many people did you bring in with these mergers? Do you have a lot of integration to go through now? Yeah. So we, we out of the seven hundred people that we are today, just over two hundred came through acquisitions, um, uh, which is a lot uh, because yeah. these are teams that have an own identity, an own culture, um, and bringing them in, especially if you come from companies such as Uber, where there's a very strong brand and a very strong attachment of the employees to the brand. It's, um, it's, it's not easy, uh, but we invested really a lot in welcoming uh, our new team members. We have a dedicated team that uh, supports the post-merge integration team, just some cultural aspect. We have the onboarding academy, we have buddy programs, we have a lot of sessions where uh, we have a lot of interaction and uh, yeah, making sure that the communication, which in this integrations is key, is overemphasized. Time to go back and open up all your OB notebooks <laughs> and dive in. <laughs> Probably yes. Probably. Actually, so in, in talking, we um, so one of what, what do you guys? We talked before we we had the call here about um, what you're going to do with remote work. I guess most of your people are remote currently. Uh, that's correct. Um, it was a big surprise to me that it works for remote. I was very, very skeptical. Um, and to be honest, at least at the beginning, I have a, feel, a feeling that productivity, at least my increased, uh, increased because you're much more focused. Um, now, of course, there are expectations uh, in the company to see how we can extend this uh, work from home policy beyond the COVID period. And we're waiting to finalize the learnings um, um, to do that. But uh, I realized that the company is still running, is still growing, um, and people really commit to remain productive. Uh, and this is why yeah, I think that this really is something that uh, will become part of, of our culture going forward. So actually, let's, as a parenthesis, let's, let's maybe do a quick poll. Um, Sandra, if you want to pull up the poll, well, we're going to do a poll on remote work. So just, just as an aside, I think we're all dealing with this, um, including people who have to do post-merger integration. Um, so what we want to do is you see the polls up here. It asks you in your organization, what kind of remote work did you see in 2019 as a benchmark? And then based on what employees are asking for, as David said, how it's gone, what kind of policies you expect in the future? So um, if you, again, depending on how you've joined, you may or may not have access to the poll, but most people should have access. So let's uh, see what we get. So Sandra, once I, I can't see, so once you've got enough responses, why don't you uh, open that up so we can take a quick look, see what the collective intelligence has to say for us. And here we go. All right, so as you'd expect, um, again, 40, the most common answer was of course, uh, half day or less uh, and a good chunk at one day. And then if you go forward, I mean, typically, yeah, what you're seeing, the most common is two days just ahead of three days. So you, you see, again, we'll see how it plays out, but certainly the system seems to be thinking about, could we shift norms of work um, to, to half time, which hopefully, David, will give you enough time together to build your culture and yet still attract the talent that wants the flexibility. Does that make sense to you? Absolutely. And I'm curious to see how this then on different teams, how, how we will apply this on different teams, because traditionally 
tech teams have been already much more remote uh, focused than non-tech teams and probably sales team. But the big challenge we have and a very uh, helpful insight is to see how can we find a common denominator for, for multiple teams that have different needs and different challenges. And that's exactly what we're working on right now. So uh, these insights are very interesting. Yep. Um, maybe one, I wanna go back, sorry to jump around a bit. Um, we talked about the acquisitions. What about the partnerships like, like, with, like with the post um, and, and how does that work? So the joint venture with Post Italiana, the partnership you're referring to is probably the biggest achievement we made this year. Why? Because we managed to convince an, the Italian postal operator, uh, the equivalent of the Royal Mail in the UK or USPS in, in the US to hand us over the entire food truck load business that they have been running for 128 years. It's over hundred million in, in business per year that they put into the joint venture called Sender Italia and we were able to unlock efficiencies. Post Italian is already saving multiple millions with respect to what they um, paid uh, uh, last year for exactly the same service, because we're now able to break or take out intermediaries, these middlemen, we're able to combine loads of different customers from Post Italiana with other customers in a more efficient way. And the most surprising thing uh, is that we managed to break even only after four months. Uh, something that was uh, we didn't expect. We planned break even almost two years later, one and a half years later. And the reason is that now we are the largest domestic freight forwarder in Italy. And the topic of tech adoption, which is challenging for us, completely changed. Um, in oh. Italy, someone that wants to work with us has to adopt our technology. In Germany, France, and the other European countries, we chase trucking companies that now can choose to, to with whom they want to work. And in Italy, we are the largest one. So everyone needs to sign up and, and, and adopt our technology. And this is why the top, we were able to digitalize much more and, and therefore increase our, our, our margins um, more than that than we expected. And just gives me hope uh, and uh, or confirms, let's say the vision that we have that once we have enough volume, you can really generate above industry margins that are significantly higher than what traditional freight brokers do today. Can you dig in a little bit more? What kind of technology algorithms are you using to drive some of the efficiencies? Um, do you have a lot of developers working on that part of the platform? Is there a data play behind this? Absolutely. Um, uh, today, a fourth of our organization is in tech, and they all, let's say, leverage data as, as a uh, as a foundation for, for what we develop. Every decision that we make is based on data that, uh, that we collect. Um, but in logistics, we are still in the process of building the basics. I'll just give you one example, GPS tracking. Every truck that is produced in Europe, or almost every truck, 90 something percent of the truck, have a GPS box, a telematic box installed. You cannot even opt out. But only in 8%, there's end-to-end -end visibility. A shipper, call it a, a, a Coca-Cola, have on average 8% of the times uh, uh, visibility to where the truck is. This has to do with the subcontracting and, and but we first have to create 100% or 90% GPS tracking visibility to then unlock a few more fancy uh, optimization opportunities. So we are still finalizing this basics. One of them is GPS tracking and, and now starting to see the benefits of then the next layer of technology mm. and algorithm, which is network optimization, reducing empty kilometers. 30% uh, of all trucks drive empty in Europe, mostly because information is symmetry. Uh, we use algorithm to do better pricing and better understand what the market uh, situation is and also to understand mm. what is the price sensitivity of our, our trucking companies. Uh, but this is now in the next step is going into predictive demand. Let's mm. assume there's a truck that unloads at 8 p.m. on a Thursday and still has one or two hours of potential driving time, which is limited in Europe. Um, we are now, or this is the vision, then I able to say, listen, use half an hour, another hour to drive to a different location because we know that tomorrow morning at 7 p.m. you'll be able to load something, a load that has is not yet in our system, but where we predict that one of three customers that do does, does that every day will request a spot load. And, and this is where we are evolving into. Wow. But we have to start with the basics. 
Yeah, but again, like we see in a lot of settings, the data is not there. So you can see once you've got the database and the scale on your platform, huge amount of value creation, um, but it'll take some time to get all those pieces there. But again, that'll be, it sounds like another force though for consolidation and scale. So um, really, you know. Be yeah, I think the, the value of data is not even clear to us today. Um, uh, we are now getting so much data from the small trucking companies that, that work with us. They now can, for example, upload invoices that they send to third parties or competitors to get the money very quickly. And this is all data for it that help us significantly, not only to optimize our pricing algorithm and a few other things, but also to better understand what are the true needs of these trucking companies and how we can help them to optimize and say, hey, listen, maybe you should do things slightly differently um, uh, uh, by using the same algorithm, the same technology we use to optimize our own network. I mean, that'd be an interesting one. Um, Cause I mean, you talked early when I asked about added value about like ABN for Ember and Bev. Um, what about for the small medium truckers? I mean, cause one of the issues these days with all the movement to digital e-commerce is a lot of the SMEs are getting squeezed. Um, are you able to, to sort of help these smaller enterprises then stay viable, at least for now? For absolutely, yes. For us, you know, we have shippers and the ABM Bavs, and then we have the small trucking companies. And our focus today is mostly also in terms of tech development on, on this trucking side, uh, which we call carrier. Uh, why? Because first of all, it's a very difficult job. As a truck driver, you spend two weeks on a road and you sleep in your truck most of the time. Um, this means that they are not very sophisticated and very small companies that operate in, in, in that uh, uh, space. So what we do today for them is fast payment. These small companies typically cannot wait 60 days to get an invoice paid. So we offer them payment within three days or 30 days, they can choose. Um, we offer them planability. They're typically at the end of a long chain and therefore always have to react last minute where we say, hey, you want to drive that every single day, then you can submit that and we can give you preferred allocation if you perform. And then we have customer service, just picking up the phone at 2 a.m. saying, hey, I'm waiting here at the warehouse and not unloading me. Are you going to pay me for this extra hour? Just answering with yes, don't worry. Our system already recorded it. Uh, we see a GPS uh, position and see that, uh, that there's a longer unloading time makes a huge difference. What we just and this is today. What we just launched is an operating system, a small platform for these trucking companies to run the entire business on a platform that we give for free. Um, and here, the technology is not the big challenge, but the adoption of technology is uh, is what we are now still have to understand um, in order to really roll this up out and and, and scale uh, and scale it. Um, so let me let's bring in the audience questions. Let me bring in Christian. So Christian is a 21J MBA student. And um, I think Sender is super exciting because it's one of these new B2B platforms um, moving away from the, the B2C space. And uh, Christian has um, been basically doing a study with an MCI professor and a leading European VC fund on B2B platforms of which Sender certainly jumps out. Um, Christian, do you wanna throw a few of the questions out from the audience, please? Of course, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I think actually as a starting point, it would be great to hear a little bit more about um, why you, you know, why you picked Berlin and how that ecosystem has helped you grow, because that's a question that was quite popular with our, with our audience. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a very good question. So Berlin is one of the two, three, four startup capitals uh, in Europe. Yeah? So it could have been London, could have been Paris, but uh, as uh, I, I'm German and the logistic market in Germany is the biggest one in Europe, we thought that Germany would be the right uh, place to start. Why? Because we could demonstrate that if it works in Germany, probably works also in other uh, markets. And we started again with parcels and parcels, especially the parcel industry market in, in, in Germany is very, very competitive. So we thought if we can really show traction in Germany, we can replicate it in the other parts of, uh, of Europe. Uh, but Berlin was a great city for us to start with. We had access to a lot of fundraising. There's a lot of investors here. And um, still today having, you know, the, the Berlin stand gives, gives, gives definitely good, uh, a good, good sign. Um, we were able to attract a lot of very good talent that was also not over expensive, too expensive, especially when it comes to engineers. 
Um, uh, there's a lot of engineers that want to come to Berlin, but also when it comes to um, uh, employees with, with different language skills. In, in Berlin, you find almost every language. When we opened the countries, we first started everything from Berlin and we launched France really over a weekend because one of our customers, Amazon, asked us whether we could also offer them same day in, in France in the summertime when the highways are closed for the big trucks and they had to replace them with smaller trucks. And we just hired, I remember one guy that was still working in a bar and had to go on to his last shift on a Saturday night before he could start full time. It was just overnight and there's so many different skill sets and languages that we were able to acquire. And then also the ecosystem, Amazon, Zalando, Notebooks Billiger, our first customers were all all based or at least have an office here in Berlin where we could have a closer interaction. I think overall Berlin was uh, was extremely important for us, especially uh, throughout the first two or three years. And another topic that's that's come up that you touched upon just before now is is how are you actually enabling a lot of the small and even micro entities that you're that you're working with digitalize their business obviously you know you mentioned that you have something in, in development now around the operating system but it would be great to hear more about what you know what are the big pain points that you're solving and, and how are you getting back to them um tech adoption is the biggest challenge for us it's not the biggest pain point for for uh, for these trucking commerce for these smes but it's our biggest challenge why because they're afraid they're afraid of technology they've been operating for 20 30 years with excel or even piece of paper and a pen and they think that still this you know it's the best way for them average age of truck drivers is 48 years in in, in germany the, the owners that were usually used to drive trucks and now have a small fleet of a few trucks are 55 sometimes six years old and extremely, extremely difficult. So for us, it's important that we first show what is the value add that we give, I call them hooks, so that they then start adopting technology. The most important one is accelerated payments. And we are able to pay within three days. And we're so successful that we said, okay, you have also other invoices, upload them in our systems, and we can also give you that invoice factor, that money within three days. And giving them support in planning, as, as I mentioned earlier, a third of all trucks are empty because of information asymmetry. They drive from A to B and then try how to get back to A, maybe through C, but they, they look every day what, what is available. Um, offering them a solution, a planner, simple planner, where uh, we can make suggestions on you know, how to fill gaps on a dynamic way because we source spot opportunities from different customers and shippers and, and, and push them and recommend, hey, listen, you have a truck here. Why don't you take that? Uh, are the things that uh, um, we think or we're already seeing as we launched three months ago, uh, drive adoption. And uh, so it's, it's these hooks that generate value that then make them ad uh, use technology. Then also 60 year old owner suddenly asks his nephew and say, hey, listen, show me how this works. If I can get the money within uh, uh, three days and I get suggestion on how to increase my utilization. No, that's very, that, that, that's very interesting. And it seems like you've uh, made a great start on, the, on, you know, on how to get that adoption up, up the curve. Um, there's also a lot of questions around, around, you know, the senders tech stack and what that, what that looks like. Um, and, I think what people are most interested in is, is, you know, what are some of the most important tools for you today, maybe both internally generated and things that you're using externally and looking for what do you think is going to be, uh, be most important? Um, it's a very good question. I don't know how much into detail uh, I, I should go, um, but the philosophy that, that we follow is that everything that is already out there and that really works, we use. Yeah. For example, Salesforce to manage contacts, we don't have to rebuild a database management and, and this on the other parts as well. So what we really focus on our resources, our 130, now 150 uh, tech team is really on developing what no one else has, which is the core of our engine, which is related to transport and, and, and logistics. Here we have developed a modular system where we can have, combine different modules to serve different needs. For example, our trucking companies have similar needs than our than we have internally, and then potentially in our shippers. One simple example is uh, load management. 
putting a load into a system is something that potentially a shipper, especially mid-sized shippers, so not the Amazons, but smaller ones that don't have a big ERP system, we have internally, and our shippers, uh, our carriers also now with the, the, the operating system provided for them, uh, need to do the same with generating invoices. We have to generate an invoice carrier to shippers have to also generate. So we build this very modular system um, because um, we, we over this year also understood that we can leverage our technology to serve much more than just our brokerage business. Our plan is to hit 2 billion in revenues in, in the next uh, four or five years. This means that we would still have less than 1% market share. But now that we have understood that we can use our technology to offer this technology also to shippers and carriers to manage their entire business fully digitally, we know that we can tap into a much bigger segment um, of the market. And this is what excites our tech team at the moment, the idea of having wide label solutions that we can give to shippers that our customers, where we have a trust relationship where we can say, hey, we can manage it really digitally. Why don't you take the same software and you run your entire business on it while keeping the contractual relationship with Send, of course, as a, as a forward, as a broker, and with all the others. And this is, let's say, what I think, uh, especially over the past six months, is brought a lot of energy and excitement into the tech team because it's taking us or the vision of our tech play to a complete different level. And you and you segue nicely into strategy there at the end, and that's where you know some of the uh, some of the other questions have been focused. Um, you talked a little bit about your thesis geographically at the onset, but it would be interesting to hear, uh, I think for a lot of people in the audience, you know, would there ever be a plan of going also beyond Europe? And if so, you know, how, how might that be done? That's a good question. Um, so first, how big is the European market? The European market is 350 billion in size, road freight. It's twice the amount of sea and air freight combined in Europe which is 170 billion, just to put things into perspective. Within road freight, the largest segment is food truck loads, what we focus on. One truck for one customer driving from A to B. This is a third, so over 130 billion. Um, the largest player have a combined market share, I mentioned it earlier, of 6%. They're doing a couple of billion in, in, in revenue in, in, in road freight. This means that there's enough space. And what I think we at Sender were able to do really well is to focus. We only did from day one, luckily, because we had these big customers, uh, food truck loads, cross regional shipments, and really focus on this segment. And this, and this is something that we want to continue to do because we know it works. It's where we can generate value up. Um, of course, we're now looking at ways to expand, uh, to do some cross-selling into more spots business. We focus more on the contractual side, signing one, two, three years contracts with the Amazons. Um, but spot business, something that now with our network, we can serve less than truck load, which is the next segment when you only have half a truck, is things that we look like. And when I just, uh, we wrote our strategy paper, our five-year strategy paper, we, um, we looked at what is Europe, the definition of Europe. Uh, and uh, the UK was not part of it, but I would say for us, that's definitely part of it. But UK, uh, Europe goes up to Russia, potentially including Russia and Turkey, potentially including Turkey. So even if we decide that we need more space to grow because Europe is not enough, probably uh, Russia and Turkey are two very interesting markets where the fundamentals of the industry are also very similar uh, that could offer an opportunity to grow. But Europe is big enough, and if we focus, we think we can become the largest player in this segment we, we're in today, and this is, let's say, what, uh, what we plan to do. Great questions. Chris John, maybe one more. I, I want to even go deeper into the future. I don't know if you have anything there, but um, one more question from the audience, please. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, we, we certainly, you know, there's a lot of interest in this, in this topic, as, as you know, um, and uh, I think one really interesting question that came in on, on this that was very popular was around what do you think um, with the introduction of autonomous driving some of the big bottlenecks are in Europe and what do you think some of the big risks are and what is, you know, Sender's long-term um, approach to managing some of those risks? I love this question. It might take me a little bit longer to answer, but this is exactly what excites me about Senda. I didn't come from logistics, but the reason why I am in logistics and love it now is because exactly of the opportunities that we're going to have that autonomous technology will unlock. Now, um, 
it's a question of time when autonomous will come. Next 20, 30 years for sure, maybe a bit earlier. If it comes earlier, probably will come into in, in trucking on the long distance from highway entry to highway exit. But maybe we have a separate lane on the highway to just reserve for autonomous uh, uh, trucks. Um, no kids playing there, easy environment to control. And then we're gonna have small, so the, the traditional trucks doing the last mile from the highway exit to the warehouse and back. Um, now we could debate when will this happen? I think the technology is already there, um, at least to a large extent, the next three, four years for sure, especially if it's in a closed environment with some infrastructure separate lane that you have on the highway. But then the question is how can this technology then be used and adopted? It will very much depend on policy makers. Um, why? Because we need this infrastructure investment means that politicians need to support this. And today I still have a feeling that Politicians are afraid of autonomous, might cost them votes. But if one day, once they realize that um, this is not the case because there are not enough truck drivers in Europe, before Corona, there are 250, 260,000 truck drivers, drivers missing because it's a difficult job. Um, I think they're going to realize that having or uh, supporting autonomous technology on the long distance is something that will help them to, 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 to gain votes. As truck drivers can suddenly sleep at home every single night making their life as a 50 year old driver much, much um, easier. So I think in the next 10 years, we're gonna see a first adoption of commercial technology on the long distance with probably the, the, the traditional trucks doing special transport, fuel transport and the last mile for the next 20 and 30 years. But I still haven't answered why this excites me. And, and the reason why this excites me is because it offers a unique opportunity to stand up. Because a lot of the established players have to fundamentally reinvent their business model. Let's take the extreme case, a truck manufacturer. We have Scania, which is one of our truck investors and the premium truck manufacturer. They today sell 70 to 80% of their trucks to companies that have fewer than 10 trucks. In 20, 30 years, these companies will probably disappear because they lose the reason to exist. First, they won't be able to buy trucks the ownership will remain with either the manufacturer or the operator. If they kill someone, it's, it's their responsibility. They definitely don't need a driver, um, which is the biggest value add. And also in terms of cost optimization, they won't be able to do much because they cannot go and change their oil at the neighbor's shop because it's a high tech machine. So they will phase out over time, next 30 years. And in, in, in that time, they will have a better life. They will sleep at home, probably do higher returns and so on, but they will phase out. And this means that if you look at truck, at a truck manufacturer, they will not have the same customers in the next 20, 30 years, which is really scary, I think, from a, a manufacturer perspective. And they have to decide whether they're just gonna produce the asset, uh, uh, put the te autonomous technology on it, or even operate it and sell the services, for example, one euro per kilometer or become logistic provider. I don't, nobody knows yet how that will play out, but we at Sender are developing two ex very important components that will play a key role in this uh, new industry setup. One side, the technology to operate in an efficient way, autonomous, non-autonomous trucks, combining loads, predictive demand. And the second thing we do is we establish custom relationships in order to have the volume to fill these trucks. And these are two components that we, think will play a fundamental role in this transformation. Um, and this is why I'm excited because what we're doing can really change a big industry. It's not gonna be our kids or grandkids they are gonna see the impact or have an impact. It's really us potentially playing a very important role in this 350 billion industry that over the next three, five, maybe seven years has to take a decision on how they will start shifting and investing so that in 20 years, they still have um, uh, a strong business model. Well, thank you, Chris. Mm -hmm. So we can definitely see it in this webinar. Lots of people are getting excited by the logistics space, the mobility space. Um, looking at it broadly, so what, I'm gonna talk a little bit about Amazon. Um, your early customer, still a customer. First of all, how much of your business is linked to e-commerce? Um, certainly. Uh, it used to be more like 70, 80%. When we started in the first year, actually it was 100%, but two years ago, we're still 
uh, 60-70%. Luckily, now we reduce it to below 10%, was also one of the asks of our investors to diversify um, our, our risk. So it's significantly smaller, uh, also because Amazon is increasingly becoming a competitor uh, of ours. Yeah. We still serve them, we still see them as partner. But if you look at what they're doing in, in the United States uh, and are testing now in the United Kingdom is directly approaching the small trucking companies that, uh, that we're approaching. They've figured out to pay them fast and how to make sure that uh, all the information flow works and how to yeah, compensate for the service level. They don't pick up a phone at uh, 2 a.m. Um, uh, so they're getting into this. But I have to say that, first of all, the market is huge. As I mentioned earlier, the largest five players have 6% market share. And I also have to say that at least in continental Europe, they will have uh, a, a difficult time to balance their network. They have uh, a lot of warehouses positioned strategically in certain parts, such as in Eastern Europe, Poland, and so on. They have a lot of volume coming from Eastern Pol Poland or from Eastern Europe into Central Europe. And to really operate that efficiently, they also have to go uh, find backloads. Mm -hmm. This is when then a lot of complexity gets added. In the US, it's slightly different. In, in the US, you have corridors that are ABBA, East Coast, West Coast, New York, Boston, and everyone drives that, that dread route and goes back and forth. In Europe, it's one-way corridors and you're on the road for two, three weeks. Um, and this is, let's say, uh, the, the challenge that it will have to face, but they're definitely coming our way. But yeah, but you could certainly see in the US, there are people at Amazon thinking that they could be a major logistic player. Similar. They are. They are already. Uh, I would say what Amazon did really well in the first step, they, they, they replicated or they built a supply chain that fits exactly their needs um, by cooperating with specialized players and now and, and putting a technology layer on top of it. We were doing the line hall. There were specialized players for the last mile. There were specialized players for airplane transportation. And even though there's always branded, it was it's still not the, the Amazon, but they put a technology and orchestrated everything so that they can fulfill this prime uh, um, the promise of delivering very, very quickly. What they're doing right now is they're going into certain verticals and, and start, start, starting to, to go deeper. They started with the last mile um, and now also with trucking and uh, yeah, not just using specialized players, but trying to rebuild that themselves. Yeah. So let me ask you a bit of a sensitive line of questions around that. What do you think much about the power of big tech, including big US tech? You see pushbacks against Amazon increasing um, and other big US tech companies. I start, to, I don't know about Berlin, but certainly in Paris, I see more discussion around digital sovereignty in Europe nationally. Um, are these things that are being talked about in Berlin or these things that, that you think of any points of view you want to share with a few hundred people? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if, if I have, um, let's say, a strong opinion. Definitely something that we hear uh, talking about. It's, it's, it's a hot topic. Um, but at least from our perspective, we don't have many alternatives today. And I think this is the big challenge. Everyone is talking about, yeah, we need a European version of AWS. We need a European version of a lot of things but we don't yet have the infrastructure. There's a number of players that have been investing and have already solution that work on a smaller scale. Um, but from a sender perspective, we're still trying to fix other aspects before we get to the point where we say, okay, how can we optimize and how can we, it's moving everything so quickly that especially when it comes to um, tech solutions that are out there, we just take what we think is the best and potentially then in a second step, try to, to yeah, to optimize and, and have more a European perspective on it. But at the very least, if you do your job well, we will have a European champion in B2B trucking platforms. That's definitely our objective. <laughs> um, let me, I wanted, I meant, I wanted to come back briefly on this, um, the sustainability thing. So clearly this was a big trend before COVID. It seems like it, especially in Europe, only gets strengthened. How, how much, um, you obviously by getting utilization up on trucks, you're contributing. How much is that part of what motivates your people, your investors? How, how does that play out in your percenter? 
it's growing. And this year, for the first time, we witnessed how important it's becoming, not only for the team, but also for, um, for our customers and also carriers willing to invest. Um, until I think last year or past two, three years, on a corporate level, on a management level in the big companies, I think everyone talked about uh, sustainability oh. <laughs> and uh, exactly, but it didn't get into down to organization. I think for the first time this year, we see a true and uh, genuine willingness to find new solution and also the willingness to pay a little bit more for significantly greener option. Until last year it was all about prices and, and capacity and maybe quality. And this year we see that for the, with the first customers, we were actually able to win them and expand our business because we offered a very attractive solution uh, when it comes to greener transport. And it's not only about utilization, uh, reducing this 33% to maybe 10%, but it's mostly also using alternative fuels, biofuels, liquefied natural gas and other forms of gas, um, uh, where you can reduce CO2 emission, depending on how you calculate it, between 60 and 80%. And this is something that we're doing. And the good thing is that we're not only able to offer this, but also bring the transparency to really measure this. This is also a big challenge. Until last year, big shippers that were uh, already looking at the, how, how, how the footprint, carbon footprint looked like, asked us to fill out once a year an Excel table where they said, estimate how much you CO2 emission where no one checked it. Now we're getting to a point where we have integration where we can um, start reading the data from the trucks where we have consumption. We monitor what is fueled, what biofuel is fueled. And that's what, for example, we do with ABMF where we show um, uh, what has been fueled uh, for, for, for the transport that we conduct. So in addition to optimizing utilization and uh, making sure that um, um, the, the vehicles use alternative fuels, we also bring in the transparency to really monitor that. And so just to be clear, you actually put some of your development effort into building the systems to deliver on the transparency. So it actually becomes Absolutely. part of the solution. And actually one thing that reminds me is in terms of where mobility is going, what do you have a view on fuels for, for these trucks? I mean, you think hydrogen, EVs, um, and then how, how much is, is that as exciting to you as the movement to um, self-driving? Um, we followed that very closely. Um, we speak uh, about this both with our customers and all our investors, uh, or in our investors, especially Scania, that is investing into this. Um, However, it's still a bit far away uh, for us. Everything that is three, four, five years out in terms of technology is something that we look, that we discuss. But since we're growing so quickly and there's so much happening today, um, uh, we just follow it. And But what we do is whenever we want to try something new, when Scania wants to try something new, our shippers try something new, that we are um, uh, the partner that makes it happen operationally. If there's, for example, a new fuel type or a new uh, engine type, let's take LNG, liquefied natural gas. It's already big in, for example, Italy and in the Netherlands that in Germany, it's not there yet. So if now suddenly a German customer wants a greener uh, transport that we want to realize with LNG, um, the, the trucking companies, the 5, 10, 50 uh, 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 truck companies, are afraid to buy a new truck where they don't know what the operating cost is going to be, what the residual value is going to be, and how you know everything going to work out. And this is when we then come in and say, hey, we commit for the next two, three, four years to, um, to guarantee you a certain utilization uh, for this. So do the investment, probably we can get you even better terms if you buy a Scania, um, and then we're going, to, we're going to support you and reduce your risk. And this is, let's say, our role today in testing and supporting the adoption of technology that already works rather than um, yeah, thinking about the technologies that are currently under development. Cool. Super, super interesting. Thanks for the perspectives. Um, as we move towards wrapping up a couple of different lines of questions. One is from the INSEAD perspective. There's a bunch of students on. So what do you, do you hire MBAs? What, what kind of roles um, might there be in, in, in a scale up like Sender? And, and do you have any advice for students who would be targeting, you know, the companies like yours growing crazy fast, um, but but short on time. Absolutely, we still hire 30 people per month. So we onboard 30 people per month. So there's opportunities, uh, a lot of opportunities. I think for MBA uh, students, especially incidents students, we have our strategy and growth team, which is kind of our 
team that uh, drives acquisitions, drive uh, expansion, and, 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 and helps the organization to fix things that don't work. We hired uh, already a couple of insiders also from the summer internship. Um, uh, so definitely apply. One of the things that I would recommend everyone uh, at the inside is to take some time and really understand the company before going into an interview. I had a couple of interviews where I asked, how would you explain Senda to a 15 year old or your grandmother? And I was surprised uh, the, to see that not everyone was very prepared. So my recommendation is if you really like a, a company, ideally Senda, take five minutes uh, before you go into the call and, 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 and prepare a little bit. Just my view is what I've seen. I mean, people working at scale-ups is some of the most interesting um, early work experience after an MBA. So I certainly encourage people to look at that. Uh, maybe another brief one. How has INSEAD contributed to your story besides giving you this crazy idea of putting parcels on buses that didn't work? Um, how, how has been that been being part of the INSEAD community on your journey? Well, there's so many touch points. First, it was my first co-founder and then a number of investors invested because of the relationship to INSEAD, especially our angel investor. Again, was when we were trying to send parcels and buses. Uh, knew that, you know, because of the of INSEAD, we had at least a basic understanding on how to potentially scale a business. Also, we have one of our, our last investors, Lakestar, that has a couple of, of people uh, that, uh, that looked at the deal and uh, told me afterwards after they approved the investment that uh, the inside connection definitely helped, uh, helped a lot. And then of course, in attracting talent, um, as I mentioned, we hired a couple of people from inside and we continue to do that, especially um, over the summer. Um, so it definitely uh, was, uh, was a great opportunity, not only to build the company, but also to kick it off. Oh, I forgot to mention that I have a couple of investors. Our first investors were inside professors and uh, classmates. And then also the, uh, the, the, the signaling that, uh, and the network that uh, I was able to access after launching was, uh, was extremely helpful. Um, as you said, you're still making sense of what you're living. But if there are many people on the call who are obviously thinking about entrepreneurial ideas or in the midst of, of trying to find their own product market fit, um, just reflecting on your experience and as someone who's emerged from that tunnel successfully uh, so far, any advice to aspiring entrepreneurs? Well, there's one advice that I received um, uh, at INSEAD in one of the an entrepreneurship classes, and I just didn't want to believe it, uh, which was plan, oh, things take longer than you expect, significantly longer to so plan for it. Uh, this is something I didn't believe back then. I thought, you know, in my case, it's going to be different. Everything's going to be quick, raising a lot of money and to see a lot of traction. That was definitely true. It took me years to get to a certain level where it's okay. And now we have achieved at least um, uh, the basics or plan and also understand what the commitment is. I did not realize that going into an entrepreneurial experience is not you try it and then six, 12 months later, it doesn't work. You try the next thing, especially when you start getting investors on board you know, the responsibility that you have um, towards the investors, the team that you then build, and then and it's, it, it's bigger than what I thought. And, and the second learning is to do homework, uh, to, to do the homework a bit better. I came out of INSEAD, I really thought, you know, it just makes sense. In theory, it just makes sense. But I, I, I did not uh, check on a practical way whether there's someone that really wants to use it. Everyone was interested. There was a lot of interest, but we no one... Um, said they would, and this is something that uh, I should have looked into more why and you know what is necessary to have the first customers on board. Um, so my learning was do the homework a bit better uh, and, and, and engage as much as you can with your potential customers early on to really understand what they need and not uh, try to sell them what you think they need. Now, anyway, David, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy agenda. Thanks for sharing so, so openly um, for, and generously from your experience. Thanks for having me. It was a pleasure. It was great. Okay, everyone. Very good. Thanks, everyone, and have a good rest of your week. Um, great to have you with us for this Tech Talk. Over and out from Berlin and Fontainebleau.